Welcome to week 4 of APH 501. This week we'll look carefully at some of the spatial concepts that inform geographical thinking. The learning outcomes for this week include that students will recognize and describe how spatial concepts are relevant to the study of human geography, and students will recognize and describe how geospatial technologies are present within and contribute to everyday life and decision making. One of the most famous still living geographers is Waldo Tobler, a retired professor from the University of California at Santa Barbara. In 1970, Dr. Tobler described a pattern that he was observing in urban growth patterns, that everything is related to everything else, but things that are near each other are more closely related than things that are far apart. This has since become known as the first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Another very well-known geographer, also from UC Santa Barbara, is Reg Gollage. Though he passed away in 2009, his intellectual legacy is strong and vibrant. Dr. Gollage spent a significant amount of time thinking and writing about the basic ideas that contributed to geographical knowledge. He called these primitives of spatial knowledge and he grouped and organized them in this hierarchical list. Off of identity, location, magnitude, and time, there are sub-primitives, and then further sub-ideas. The last research studies he did before he died involved designing basic GIS activities for students in elementary school to see how and when they began to grasp these early spatial and geospatial ideas. When he was the president of the Association of American Geographers, he drafted a lengthy list of skills, abilities, and practices that he believed were consistent with geographic thinking and reasoning. They included comprehending scale transformations, being able to transform perceptions, representations and images from one dimension to another and the reverse, comprehending superordinate and subordinate relations and frames of reference, things like cardinal directions, relational um, frames of reference, local frames of reference, global frames of reference, comprehending problems of spatial alignment, comprehending distance effects like distance decay, Comprehending spatial association, whether it be positive or negative. Comprehending orientation and direction, backwards, forwards, back, front, north, south, east, west. Comprehending spatial classification, like making regions. Comprehending clustering and dispersion, the tendency to centralize or disperse. Comprehending spatial change and spatial spread, the idea of diffusion, comprehending hierarchies that were spatial or non-spatial, comprehending densities and density decay, like the way that population density has different gradients in different cultural settings, comprehending spatial shapes and patterns, the ideas behind geometrical geometry and topology. Comprehending locations and places. Comprehending the ideas of overlay and dissolve, which either helps you aggregate or disaggregate things on a spatial basis. Comprehending integration of geographic features that are represented as points, networks, or regions. Comprehending the idea of spatial closure or interpolation. Comprehending proximity and adjacency, the idea of nearest neighbor, and the effects of that, also measurable through distance decay. Finally, recognizing spatial forms, such as city spatial structures, or relating traverses or cross sections to three dimensional block diagrams or images. This lengthy list, which you also saw uh, from the Gollage article that you read this day, uh, has led a lot of scholars to wonder whether all of these ideas merit being included. What other ideas have been overlooked? 
Is there any order to this list? Must some of these ideas happen first in order for the next to be possible as we become spatial thinkers? One way that the long list can be condensed and simplified is that many of these ideas somehow relate to four categories. Things related to location, scale, patterns, and patterns over time. This may not be the only way that Gollage's ideas could be grouped, but it is one way to understand geographic practices. Notice too the terms here and the ideas that you've seen come up before in the different definitions of spatial thinking or in, for example, Phil Gershmael's different modes of spatial thinking. We're beginning to see some connections here. The next step can be to look at patterns themselves through the lens of a spatial concept, such as distance. All of those types of patterns that we culled from Gollage's list have been affected by distance in one way or another. How can we measure distance, absolute versus relative distance, how distance affected a process or an action, or any time of human or natural activity that resulted in the patterns we were considering. Understanding distance is also key to many of the models that we study in human geography. Could you say why and how? Could understanding the role of distance across these models and others be one way that your students are able to compare and contrast and learn more effectively and efficiently about these different models? So while distance might seem like a very simple idea to you, one that you might think that you understand within these different dimensions, I encourage you to think about these different spatial concepts as a lens through which you can filter the knowledge of human geography. Help your students think in that way as well. Distance is a spatial concept that affects many models and affects geographical understanding in general. What are other spatial concepts that are significant in these different geographical areas? Sometimes a human geography text book might single these out and talk about the role of shape in political geography, for example, or boundaries in urban geography. Recognizing and understanding the spatial concepts that are particular to these different topics is not too difficult, and it serves as a common thread across the rich and diverse content of the human geography class. And that's one way to think about your role as an instructor of AP Human Geography. The curriculum may largely be selected by others, but how can you use how can your use of spatial thinking, instructional design, graphicacy, and technology support? How can those support student learning? How can you take advantage of these areas to encourage learning that is deep? and endures past the exam in May. These professional development courses are one step towards that goal. That's all for now.